All right. Well, welcome to the Sports Guys to another great episode this week. We're really glad you joined us. Um, as you can see, we have a special guest, our cousin Sarah. Hey, Sarah. Hi. How are you doing? Hey, Good. Sarah. How are you guys? How are you doing, Robbie? Great. We have a really awesome episode this week. We've been looking forward to this for a couple of weeks since we saw Sarah in Charlottesville in April. You might have seen our Charlottesville episode where we went to see her son Tommy play lacrosse and uh, had a great time up there. This week, we're going to talk about what it's like to run an Airbnb or a short-term rental. Um, Sarah has two of them. We have one of them, and we're looking for a second right now. Uh, we've kind of been through a little bit of everything in the past year, Rob and I, and I know Sarah's kind of more of a veteran than we are on this. So, Sarah, we're really glad you could join us and give us your perspective. So Happy to be here. Yeah, really excited about it. We're really uh, excited to be in this venture We've learned a lot uh, about Airbnb, about VRBO, about all the different providers, what it's like to get a management company, um, what it's like to find the right cleaning service, how to do marketing, uh, how often to give out the friends and family rate versus not give it out. You know, sometimes we've been guilty of giving it out too much and then we end up with an unprofitable month. So uh, we're, we're learning, right, and trying to figure out how to do this thing, but uh, we're getting better at it. So love to hear uh, both you guys' perspective, and then I'll give you mine on kind of what it's like to be an Airbnb owner, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And then we're going to get into a presentation after that. We're going to go through a, a number of things I've put together around, you know, tips to be successful, some of the things that owners do that maybe uh, are mistakes and things they should rethink, uh, and some of the other uh, things you need to think about as an owner. So Sarah, you want to lead us off? Sure. So I have been a realtor for about 16 years, and I've also been licensed as a loan originator. And Airbnb seemed like a natural thing for me because I love buying homes. I love rehabbing homes. And I thought that it would be a great kind of next foray in real estate. So my son got accepted into the University of Virginia to play lacrosse, as you talked about. And I wanted to I grew up down there, so I wanted to find a property close to the university that I could use myself and rent out. And there happened to be a foreclosure property on the mountain that I purchased and rehabbed. Now, I wouldn't necessarily recommend, in fact, I would not recommend buying a rehab for an Airbnb, especially because I bought a bigger home and it took a lot longer than I thought to get it up to the level I would want it to be to start renting it. So that's kind of my first tip is I would look for something smaller and manageable. It doesn't matter if you have to do some work on it, but this was like a complete rehab. So what are you thinking? What are you thinking for rehab? Are you thinking um, sell or rent for rehab and not do the Airbnb model? So for rehab, it's either you fall in love with it. It's a great price. You're going to rehab it and use it all the time for yourself, or you're going to flip it you know, mm-hmm. and try to sell mm-hmm. it in 1031 exchange, buy something else with that those profits. Mm-hmm. But for Airbnb, because it took so long to get the work done, and part of that is that it was on top of a mountain. It was a little more challenging to get contractors up there. Yep. But for Airbnb, if you're going to buy something that needs work, that's okay, but it needs to be in an area where you have good access to people that can help you do the work. And also it's a size that's manageable. This Mm -hmm. is a big house. There's good and bad to that. Uh, The long story short was it took really over a year to get it to where it needed to be, but I've been renting it now for over two years and it's steadily doing better and better each year. I still Mm -hmm. use it myself some of the time, but it's rented most weekends and it's Mm -hmm. almost year round which is wow. fantastic. And the other key thing, mm-hmm. one of the positives of a big house is that it sleeps 14 people. So that mm-hmm. means you're going to get more per night mm-hmm. and it's going to uh, you know, appeal to people having ski weekends or bachelorette parties. So it's appealing to bigger groups, um, which means you know your nightly rate is higher because mm-hmm. it's all about mm-hmm. the sleeps number. And you and I will tell you, our family used to, go, used there. to go there 22 straight years. We used to go to Wintergreen. And it definitely was a year year round experience. We sometimes went even during the summer and had a great time, but especially yeah. during especially during the winter, we would get, have yes. our winter reunion. We would ski, we would um, snowboard, we would tube, have a great time. But I can see how it would be a twelve month situation. So that's great. Yeah, the hiking and you know, just all the beautiful and you know, let's there's a lot of breweries and vineyards in the area now too. 
So it's a real destination spot. And so I'll end with saying, I think the key thing when you're looking for a property is look for something that you is either ready to go or you can get ready to go, meaning rentable within a short period of time, a couple months, and look for something with really good recreational opportunities. There's got to be a draw. You want people to to want to come to that area. And, you know, Rob's going to talk about your beach house. Clearly, that's a draw. Wintergreen has the skiing, the hiking, et cetera. But it also in the valley at the bottom of the mountain, it has a lot of different things to offer in terms of antiques, vineyards right. and breweries. And, and golf. It's got golf also. That's right. One of the best golf courses, according to my son, he said, is in Stony Creek. So that's true. Yeah. So uh, qu question I had for you, when is the peak time? Like, what are the peak months and what would be the max you could charge in those peak months? And then what would be your non-peak months and how far down do you have to dip to get so, you know occupancy? I feel that the peak months with Wintergreen and probably with any ski resort type Airbnb property are going to be January, February. Okay. Um, now, this is obviously a southern ski resort, so February even starts to, it doesn't taper off, but March is my slowest month. And is it real? Up, okay. up in New England, if you had a ski property, that would be a busy month. So mm -hmm. you think about, you know, where you're buying. And so during the busiest months, I'm charging some nights. I I utilize smart pricing. That's like a whole other topic, right. but I do utilize mm -hmm. that. That's a feature with an Airbnb where yep. you set your minimum. And then you set your maximum and it kind of looks at all the other properties, what people are charging and it sets a price. And mm -hmm. I find that that's doing a lot of the work for me. Um, if a weekend isn't renting, I'll go in and maybe lower the price a little bit just to try to get someone to rent it. But mm -hmm. the maximum I'm charging is in the 600 range. Um, the minimum I'm charging is about 425 a night. But if you think mm -hmm. if there's 10 people staying there, that's still really reasonable. That's right. cheap. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really good value for the people. You have multi-levels. And how many bedrooms is it? So it has five bedrooms and it has mm -hmm. a loft and like a main area. And then it has a whole other kit. So it has two kitchens. The lower level has its own kitchen, its own bedroom and bathroom. So they don't mm -hmm. have to do stairs. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a really great house. It's very versatile. Um, it was worth all the work. I definitely say it was truly blood, sweat and tears. There was a lot of tears. Mm -hmm. It was a very stressful experience. I had you know we won't go into all of it but um it was totally worth it because now it's a great big house in a in a really attractive that's area. awesome well, uh, we were telling sarah before the program started that we want to do an exchange with her for the winter green house and she can go to the <laughs> beach house and she said yes so i will take you we up will on definitely that. do that uh before we move on from this property to your second one um tell us quickly about the bear incident <laughs> oh jeez. so i my children are telling me that the bear is my spirit animal because I have literally had, I think I have 90 reviews right now, and not one of those tenants, those renters, has ever encountered a bear at Wintergreen. And wow. they're probably not being that careful. I mean, I tell people you need to lock your doors and don't have food in your car. Don't but leave trash I, out. You know. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I have been there. I probably stayed there, honestly, six times in the three plus years I've owned it. And mm -hmm. of those six times, two of them, I had a bear come. So the, oh. the first bear incident was the kids and I um, and my ex-husband, who I'm good friends with, were all staying at the house. And one night we had a lacrosse tournament the next day. We didn't know that you couldn't even leave the window a crack because the scent, the bear's nose is so developed that it can smell like five miles away or some ridiculous thing. <laughs> and the kids had made like a, a bolognese sauce. Yeah. And they were eating like peanut butter crackers. So they had left a lot of stuff out in the kitchen being typical teenagers. And there was also a planned power outage that night. That's important to remember on mm -hmm. the mountain. So we had a planned power outage and we had teenagers eating and leaving windows open. About 3 a.m., my daughter Charlotte texted me and her dad and said, I think there are animals in the house. I'm hearing weird noises. So the whole family starts texting. I'm in one room with my dog. My son and my ex-husband are in another room. And my daughter and her friend are on the other side of the house. The long and short of it is a large mama bear and three cubs. It's like the three little bears. It's like Goldilocks and three little bears. Mm -hmm. Three cubs came onto the deck. They smelled peanut butter. They smelled bolognese sauce. There was a kitchen window. <laughs> <Bolognese sauce. laughs> that was a casement window that, you know, the kind that go out like this. 
Yeah. So the mom, you could see her paw on the sill. She pushed the window open. Luckily, she could not fit through it, but she fed the cubs through the window. Uh -huh. So the three cubs were in the kitchen ransacking it. We were all opening our doors and we could hear um, it's, we didn't know what was in the house. Um, I called 911. They said, stay in your rooms. If you can lock the doors, lock the doors. It's probably bare. <laughs> yeah, we're going to send an officer there. Um, remember, it was a planned power outage, so it's totally dark on the mountain. So this very, I don't know if I can say the word badass, but a very tough officer showed up. Littler guy. He had a shotgun on his shoulders. And I heard him talking to 911, and he said, I just got to see if I can take care of this without getting killed myself. And I was like, uh... Uh, <laughs> and I was terrified. So he basically, as soon as the blue and red lights came, the mom mm. and the cubs got scared. There was a window open back. Cubs ran out. Mom called mm. them. They went back up the mountain. But we had kind of a mess to deal with. Wow. So that was lesson learned. <laughs> what a story. What a story. Did you have to do a second rehab after that? <laughs> <laughs> no, just a lot of cleanup. They broke plates. Oh, and the only thing they took when they went out the window was a jar of peanut butter. Oh, wow. That the top wasn't on because the kids had left the top up. What That's what they took. So you guys have locked the windows ever since? Now we lock all the windows. We lock all the doors. We don't ever have food, you know, out with the screen open. But I'm telling you, I'm sure the renters don't all do that. And there's never been a bear. But I do. So one of the things I do do getting back to Airbnb is I always send a welcome email, which I'm sure you guys do too. Right. And mm -hmm. one of the things I say in the email is very important in all caps Wintergreen has a lot of bear activity. Um, you have to be very careful about not leaving food in your car. Please always mm -hmm. lock your car. Bears are not a threat necessarily to humans, but they can be a threat to property. And please make sure you lock the windows and doors of the house. So I do add that in. And one, a couple of people have said that really scares me. I'm not so sure I want to come. And I talk to them about it. But I think it's really important if there is something that could potentially be a hazard You've right. got to tell people in advance. No question. Have you put a beware of bear up, uh, like a sign up kind of thing? <laughs> so Wintergreen actually created uh, magnets that say, they call the whole campaign, Be Bear Smart. So they have mm -hmm. these little like oval magnets with a bear on it. And it tells you mm -hmm. all the things to do and not do. And I have those on my two refrigerators because I have the two kitchens. So each refrigerator has that one like front and center. And did you put it in the little book that you have there with the rules of the house? Like Yes. You're and it would, it's almost like with a beach house, you guys could have something like beware of riptides. I mean, I don't know if you're going to go to that extent, but because it's not necessarily something that would impact the house, yeah. but it's if the area has something that could potentially be hazardous mm -hmm. and you're mm -hmm. hearing about it in the, you know, alert Actually, Rob, Rob's done a really good job with our uh, book that we have at the beach house. And he's put a lot of really good information in there. So, and those books, people do look through them. Mm -hmm. And do yeah. you all have like a, a guest sign in book too? Yes, we have both. Yeah. Yeah, I do too. And it's really fun. You see people are signing in, telling where they're from, what they like about the house. And uh, I really recommend doing those guest books as well. It's it's interesting. We've had a couple of guests um, who did the Airbnb review. Actually, most of them have done the Airbnb review, but not done the guest book. And then we've yeah. had others like friends and family or others who've just done the guest book and not done an Airbnb yeah. review. So you get like a little broader perspective when you get both of them. Yes, I agree. What were you going to say, Rob? Um, what I like about our guest book is that it's, um, there's the information book and then there's the guest sign-in book and the sign-in book is, has questions already in it. Like, yeah. what was your, what was your favorite memory from this trip? Um, what were your favorite restaurants? And it, it was, it's kind of, it, it feeds them into remembering some of their, bringing back some of their memories and putting it down on paper. So it's really, it's kind of cool. It, it leads them to remember what a great time they had. Indeed. And you know, what's good about that too, is your future guests, because everybody always leaps through that, are going to see those restaurants and stuff. And that's a recommendation for them while they're there. No question. Sure. They go sure. through that too. And they yeah. read, we love the beach, especially in the morning. Well, we should go check it out in the morning. You know, they, yeah. they kind of feed off the ideas. And you know, we yeah. do, we collect menus from every single restaurant on the island and we leave Very smart. paper menus there and, and we leave, especially the ones we really like. I do the, the same thing. Mm -hmm. thing. I think that's brilliant because people are, people are always asking for recommendations. Mm -hmm. And actually in my little intro email where I warn them about the bears, 
I do say, you know, you might want to pick up groceries in Waynesboro because there's not a big supermarket around here. We're on mm -hmm. a mountain. And mm -hmm. I, I tell them all the restaurants I like mm -hmm. and the breweries we like. That's great. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about your second property. <clears throat> so that's exciting for me because I just started it. Um, I live in Laconia, New Hampshire year round. And that's um, almost like a resort town because it, Lake Winnipesaukee is here, which is the biggest lake in New Hampshire. And it's a very beautiful part of New Hampshire. We're at the start of the White Mountains. So the house I have here is a nice size house. And we just finished the basement last summer. And we're not using it that much because we don't really need it. But it's a nice walkout. I don't even call it a basement. The realtor in me calls it the lower level. Because it's not mm -hmm. really a basement. Because mm -hmm. it has a ton of windows, walkout, its own bedroom, bathroom, kitchenette, no stove, but everything else. I put like a hot plate down there, a convection microwave. And that's another thing is that you can really Airbnb a lot of different spaces. And right mm -hmm. now, a lot of people are struggling financially. It's tough out there. And Airbnb can be a great, as my son would call it, side hustle. No doubt. So if you have a space in your house that you think could work well for a guest. Don't, you know, this is my lower level in my house. We have soundproof ceiling tiles. So you'd mm. never even know someone's down there or that someone's up here, but mm. it's a nice big space. They have, they can park right next to the house. They have total privacy, their own entrance. And there's a lot of things in the area that are drawing people in. So I had my first guest actually last weekend, they were here for a concert we have a concert venue about 10 minutes away. Mm. People are coming for concerts. They're coming to go to the cool. late weddings. And um, that is a much smaller sleeps number. That mm -hmm. has one bedroom. So it technically sleeps two, but I put a sleep sofa in the other side of the finished basement because uh -huh. it's a big space. So why not say, it sleeps four because it does. Now I have a queen sofa bed. So mm -hmm. it sleeps four. They share the bathroom, but there's plenty of room for both. Mm -hmm. And so the amount I'm charging for that is around, I think my minimum is like $225 a night. Um, we have the oldest motorcycle week in the country that's coming up and it's really hard to find places. So for that week, I think I charged $325. You know, mm -hmm. I upped the price a bit. Um, because people are paying still, that to stay in a tiny that's house. That's a pretty good rate, right? I mean, for it's two people. It's a really people, good rate. Couch, that's a really good rate. It's a really yeah. good rate. Because yeah. they also have outdoor space to sit in, you know, mm -hmm. lots of parking. I probably could get more. So I'm still learning the Laconia market. Mm -hmm. I know the Wintergreen market really well. But mm -hmm. I was adding up my bookings, and it's already over $5,000 in bookings for like wow. the next six weeks. That's so awesome. Airbnb is a great, and it's not just Airbnb, but sh we should say short-term <laughs> rentals in general True. can be a great way to generate extra money. Mm -hmm. um, some people are just kind of overwhelmed by where to begin. But the nice thing about Airbnb is we, Rob and I are both, and Tom, we're all super hosts. So a lot of times Airbnb, if you don't know a super host, will pair you with one that can right. help you build your first listing and, you know, get familiar with the whole platform. True. Very true. Yeah. I, I was telling uh, Sarah earlier that um, my dad and his wife prefer to start with booking.com. Um, they look there first and then if they can't find something, they go to Airbnb, but you know, everyone has their own preference. Yeah. Some, people like, some people like VRBO. You know, I know Rob and I have never had one listing come through VRBO. Me ever. either. Everything's and mine's on VRBO too. Yeah, everything always come through Airbnb every time. I don't know why that is, but, um, you know, there's lots of good opportunities out there. We'll talk about some of those. So now you're looking at open a third one, too. Yeah. So um, my boyfriend and I do love to rehab properties. Well, I don't know if love is the right word, but we've done quite a few and we're good at it. So we bought um, Northern Maine up in Aroostook County, which is where the Appalachian Trail ends. So mm -hmm. Wintergreen is on the trail. It mm -hmm. ends in Northern Maine near Mount Katahdin. And mm -hmm. we bought um, an old dairy farm that uh, three acres of land, you see sunrise on one side, sunset on the other. Wow. Big, beautiful barn. It needs a lot of work. Don't get me wrong. Um, for $80,000. I mean, that's oh like, you can't touch that. Right. And the snowmobile oh trail is 50 yards from the house. 
Really? So we bought this almost two years ago and we've been fixing it up. And the plan is to eventually Airbnb it a bit because you're going to get a ton of snowmobilers in the Mm -hmm. winter. And Mm -hmm. the thing is, as the winters are warming up in many places, Mm -hmm. um, parts of New Hampshire that used to be big snowmobile havens are not as much so because they're not getting as much snow. Interesting. And so Northern Maine is where a lot of people are going. So we think it'll rent well in the winter. And it actually will rent well in the summer because of Katahdin. Mm-hmm. So Katahdin is like really famous place to hike. Um, absolutely beautiful area. So that will be the third one. Super and I cool. think, yeah, that one I think would probably sleep like six. And it would mm-hmm. probably be more in like the 250 range per night. Okay. That's good. Yeah. I bet you a lot of those folks that we uh, went to Iceland with that were over there when we were there, like the <laughs> snowmobile and, and going oh, glaciers. Sure. Those are the people all that those, are in Maine. All those Vikings like winter sports. Yeah, they're very <laughs> rugged people. That's true. Well, let me hand it over to Rob. Rob, tell us a little bit about your experience from the past year. You and I have kind of lived it together, but I'd love to hear <laughs> what it's been like for you, the good, the bad, the ugly, um, you, what, what you've learned. You and I have made some mistakes, but we've also done, done a lot of good things too. Yeah, I don't think we've made any catastrophic errors. Um, we've we've been we made some good decisions. First of all, one of the first decisions we made was we need we wanted a place that was pretty much ready to go. We we didn't want to spend time rehabbing. Yeah, we're um, not, we don't have the talent you have, Sarah. We, we we're not. Smart. Yeah. You guys are smart. <laughs> actually, well, we did we did some flip homes um, some years ago. We actually did pretty well with them. But uh, it, it's easier not- if you it's easier if you do the rehab in your same town uh, to get it up and running quickly so since we're you know two hours and two and a half hours away uh we we wanted to go with something that was ready to ready to go um so that was one of our best decisions also um we kind of went against the grain a little bit a lot of the rent rentals there um are on stilts Mm, um yeah and and our management company originally said we'd never rented one that wasn't on stilts we don't know how it's going to go. And he admitted it's one of the best ones. It's one of the best ones he has because the elderly, um, we are pet friendly. So we made a decision since it's not yes. ocean front, we, we want it to be pet friendly. Instead, we have a privacy fence. There's a lot of houses around there don't have that amenity. So we felt like we had a lot of amenities we could work with a nice layout, um, enough space, Three bedroom, two bath, two full bath, screened in patio, uh, privacy fenced in backyard, um, and a nice little golf cart ride uh, to the beach. So um, we knew that we were going to have to have a couple projects. We went on, and uh, what we realized was the golf cart's really popular in the in the warm months, and the hot tub is really popular in the colder months. Yeah, and um, so. We decided we were going to need both to just make it over the top with uh, a lot of things to offer for a lot of people. Some people want nothing to do with the golf cart. Some people want nothing to do with the hot tub, but most people want both. Um, so it's a lot to offer uh, for families. Uh, people bring their dogs because their dogs are part of their family. Mm-hmm. And um, it's set up nicely uh, to have the screen in porch is a great place to have breakfast um, the hot tub, we, we'd go in every night. It's got a nice fire pit. Um, so we picked a property that we had a vision for, and we we were able to go on and add to it a lot of the amenities. And he has been stunned um, at how we stayed full. Um, we had a really um, awesome long-term renter over the winter, and he said that was one of the best he's seen. Um, we actually had an offer for this coming winter, too. We couldn't come to terms with what we were charging, but um they really wanted to lowball but there is a lot of interest in the winter time rentals which is interesting how long um, was that rental the long-term one it was from the middle of december to the last day in april oh wow that's great yeah so it was interesting we we got kind of locked out of the house for quite a long time <laughs> and uh when we went in there i actually reserved it the whole week afterward um we we needed to do just a tiny bit of work in there but um, when we originally bought the place, it has a, a shed in the back where they used to park their golf cart. And when I went in there, one of the things I had to battle was uh, there was hornet's nests. 
and there was a lot of hornets in there. Multiple, multiple. <laughs> he battled yeah. them for weeks. Yeah. So I had to what I what I discovered was the roofing was actually open. And so I had to close it off and put all these boards in. And then underneath was also open. So I had to screen off the whole bottom with lattice and screening. And um, it it was quite a battle in the be beginning. But I got stung and I kept running into hornets. And I remember thinking that uh, this isn't going to be good if people walk in there to go get their beach chairs. So we flip-flopped. I leave it locked. And we gave up our outside owner's closet to our renters and I keep the shed locked with all our stuff in it. So and we, we still use the shed for, you know, the lawn mower and for, uh, you know, lawn. Yeah, yeah. no, but that yeah. makes sense. Bikes, chairs. I just thought it was a pretty bad safety thing to walk our guests into uh, that situation. Even if, I mean, I killed a bunch of them off right away, but they kept coming back. So I've got it now to where I haven't really seen one in a long time. So I think I won the battle, but we'll see. Um, the dead part of summer when they come out of the ground and then they want to go nest is really the problem. So, In terms uh, of the we'll pricing, see. Sarah, we'll we, we've been using the smart pricing similar to you. Um, oh, you yeah. use it too. Yeah, yeah we do. Rob, Rob works really closely with Connor to make sure that it's priced correctly. We do the same thing you do. Sometimes we'll drop it if it's not rented and we're two weeks out or something. Um but, you know, we're, we're still kind of learning Oak Island, too. We're not exactly, you know, we've only been there a year. So we're learning. What, what was interesting was a lot of last year, we actually didn't use the smart pricing yet. Um, and he did kind of give us some praise. He said that you guys kept the pricing exactly where it needed to be. And he said, I actually have one other property that rents. I think he has about 20 properties. Um, he manages, yeah. Yeah, he manages. Um he said there's one other one that rents maybe more than you guys, but unfortunately they, they have their rent too low. And mm. so they get a lot of riffraff. And That's he said, every thing, time yeah. our cleaning crew goes in there, it smells like pot. No. There's a broken lamp and no. there's cigarette, cigarette markings in the carpet and cigarettes and put out in weird places. And then holes in the wall, you know. strange fluids in corners of the, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> um, <laughs> God, God what knows what happened here. Um, it it kind of varies. I try not to let it go be below two hundred, but yeah. in peak season, um, about three fifty. Yeah. So it's reasonable, you know. It's, it's yeah, not it the is because you have three bedrooms and two full bathrooms. Yeah. Well, one of the reasons we so do three fifty is because we're still a two to three minute drive off of the beach. Yeah. No, I get that. Yeah, it's two beach. minutes to drive there, so. Um, People at the beach are getting five, six hundred, right? So, but yeah. they're also paying a lot in insurance for coastal, you know, flood insurance. Yeah, yeah we actually, nice we're, we're actually we're not, out of the flood zone. Yeah, yeah so we're not technically good. in a flood zone. So, I um, would not buy a property unless it. I mean, I love the idea of the coast, but I would have. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't want to be right on the water. Yeah, if if I had my choice, I'd be a few blocks back. Yeah, um, a little closer than we are now, but. Honestly, we love it. Like it. Yeah. We, I mean, you're we, load the, we load the golf cart up. It's a six seater and it's got, all perfect. Kind of, it's got the, the, the back, <laughs> um, the back storage area. And we just load it up with our, our beach chairs and our, all of our stuff. And we drive it up there and it couldn't be better, you know, cause it's registered with the city. So it's free parking everywhere. Oh, that's so great. When people come in and stay, they, it's pay parking. So yeah. when you take the golf cart, it's free. You know, we love so the great. golf cart. We love the golf cart so much we actually dread getting <laughs> in the car while we're at the beach. We we drive it down to go get ice cream. You know, oh, it's, I would use it all the time. We drive yeah, it we down do. pickleball. We court take we take pickleball. it into town for everything. Yeah. <laughs> Dinner. Why not? Yeah. So we still what's, have some, still have what's some super nice, time. what's super nice about bringing it back from the beach is you're soaking wet, covered in sand. You don't want to get in your car. Right. You know. The golf cart with little kids and yeah. yeah, golf carts made for you dry off on the way home, and you kick your sand off, and then you go around back to the outside shower, which feels great at the end of the day, and you just shower off, go inside, probably shower again inside once you knocked off all the sand and outside, <laughs> and then you get ready for dinner. You know, so. an outside shower is key. I love oh, when yeah. I rent a beach house and there's an outside shower. It's like the best Dude. thing in the world. Actually, we, yes, we, asked people, 
We ask Love people it. to use the outside shower before they get in the hot tub. Oh, so we yeah. Have, we have like yeah. a rule for the hot tub. Yes. So, yeah, there's yeah. actually algae and stuff that can come from the ocean that ruins the pump. Yeah. So um, you actually have to wash off the ocean water from your body. Yes. To, that makes to sense to me. Tub. Yeah. Yeah. We have a couple of projects, Sarah, that we'd like to do. Um, it's one of those things where we feel like if we left the house the way it is, it would rent forever. It'd be fine. But yeah, we want to we want to just keep putting new cool stuff like we want to build a bocce court in the backyard. Mm -hmm. Oh, I love that. And, um, we yeah. want to put we want to put some palm trees up in the front yard. And, you know, those white rocks that look really cool at the beach. We want to do some yes. white rocks because grass, does. grass does not do well. there. Rob battles with the grass all the time. Now, have you ever have you guys thought about the artificial grass? Because that yeah. stuff looks very real. Yeah, we've, we've a, spoken. Yeah, we've spoken with um, uh, two people about that and just kind of got the idea of how we want to lay it out. Yeah, because um, it looks a lot of people up here use it. The lake houses where they're not there all the time. They have the artificial yeah. grass and mm -hmm. it looks so real. Yeah, it's it's not only that, but they have the de design now to where it's really good for when animals pee on it and stuff like that. Oh, wow. Um, it's, it it drains important. really well. It drains well. That's um, important. That's they good. have it down to where it doesn't get moldy. So oh, good. Yeah. Yeah. I think eventually we'll move to that, but we want to do all the backyard projects first. Uh, yeah. Rob, wants to put a, Rob wants to put a tiki bar in. And I love that. Just all kinds of cool stuff. So. Now I have, you know, the, the one I just started in Laconia, it's still very new, but I had bought like these cornhole, um, like the cornhole boards with the bean bags. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to put those back there. I mm -hmm. have some, you know, Adirondack chairs. I just think when it's nice weather, people want to be outside and you have yeah. to think about if you were there, what would you want? Um, and we have a pool table inside and we know people are going to use that, but even things like just having an Amazon Alexa, you know, like mm -hmm. one of the uh, speakers, mm -hmm. everybody knows how to use those. You give people yeah. the Wi-Fi. Those things make a difference. It makes people feel like they're at home. It's like mm -hmm. the comforts of home. And when I get reviews, it, they always say her place is well stocked. You know, she's a good communicator and we just feel like we're at home. And that's what you want right. when you have an Airbnb. That's true. We get the same yeah. comments. I would mm -hmm. say those comments are very um, frequent for us as well. So obviously those are main things people are looking for is they want to feel at home. They yeah. want to know they have somebody to go with to get questions and information mm -hmm. from easily. It's not like pulling teeth to find out where there's a good restaurant or something. Right. Um, you know, I, I, in fact, I have to send the information in waves so that I don't overwhelm them with all the information about the golf cart, all the information about the hot tub, <laughs> all the information about even using the front door lock. Yeah. You know, it's got security measures. And, you know, so I, I, I tell them there's more information coming. You know, I, I don't want to send it all in one shot. And then I send the code. We have, we have, two lock boxes behind the front door. One yeah. has the lock box that um, you undo the locks for the hot tub because each corner has a little lock. Oh, and then right. the other lock box um, undoes the, or is the golf cart. That makes sense. So, yeah. I think um, every Airbnb owner, the best Christmas present I ever got was from my sister, Jenny. She gave me a laminating machine. Mm -hmm. I use mm -hmm. that thing all the time. And so mm -hmm. to your point, Rob, about all the information, I do yeah. pass it along in, in messages, but I also laminate everything. So for example, at Wintergreen, the fireplace is a big focal point of that house. It gets a little, you know, you want to make sure people are being safe using the fireplace, open mm -hmm. the damper, you know, dispose of the ashes. So I have every, you know, all the instructions like typed up and laminated and my mm -hmm. checkout instructions are laminated. I have That's a lot. Nice. And then the bear smart is laminated. And like, I have a, you know, a, a bulletin board and I have it right on that board. So I think having a laminating machine and laminating a lot of stuff like that is yeah. good too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good, good idea. No we have a lot of the same kind of information in our, um, in our, in your book, welcome book. And it's yeah. in, it's in sleeves. So yeah, no, well, those plastic sleeves are great. But, same thing. Yeah. yeah. That's the same exact thing. You know, yes. we were so we were so excited to buy this house together. We've been talking about it for years. We finally bit the bullet and did it. I'm so glad you're doing it too. Um, and now we want to go get our second. And um, a lot of the lenders we work with say the way to do it is you go pull a hundred thousand dollars out of the other house. That's what you, they all you, say to do. And you take that money and you go buy the second one. And yes. then you you stay with that house for another year and you go buy a hundred thousand out of that one. 
absolutely and pull it out by your third one so that's kind that's of that's how that's we the did plan. the one in maine was pulling equity out to buy the house in maine now granted that was a very cheap house but it's going to need a lot of work so right. using the equity in real estate you already own right. is a very smart way to do that kind of stuff exactly right have you had any um challenging events with airbnb anything that's been difficult i was very lucky I was careful not to brag that I had nothing but great guests. I did have a more challenging one. I don't know how you guys feel about renting to people. What I like about Airbnb is they do verify we the guest. We screen. Yep. And they actually had, I had someone that really wanted to rent my lower level here in Laconia, New Hampshire, and Airbnb actually rejected them because of past issues. Yeah. Um, yeah. And they were reaching out to me saying, we really want to book. And Airbnb was like, no. But what happened was in the Virginia property, um, I had a new guest who had never had a review, which I'm always mm -hmm. a little wary of. Mm -hmm. And it was a big group. And they didn't destroy anything, but they didn't follow any of the checkout instructions. They left the house very, very messy. Dishes in the sink, trash. None of the beds have been stripped. So I ended up paying my housekeeper, who's wonderful, more money to clean it, mm -hmm. which was a little frustrating. Mm -hmm. um, I could have gone after them. I did send them a message and said, you know, you didn't follow any of the instructions. You know, I was upset to hear that. And they were contesting that a bit. And I just chose to walk away from it. Did you, but I did. You give them, did you give them a bad review? I did. And mm -hmm. I hate doing that. But mm -hmm. there are times when you need to do it. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, how Airbnb says, would you recommend this guest to other hosts? And I said, absolutely not. Because they didn't have respect for the house. And I was yeah. very nice and accommodating to them and let them check in early. And But that was, I've been very lucky because out yeah. of 90 plus guests, that's really the only one that was really tough. That's good. What about you guys? Have you had anyone challenging? I mean, we, as far as guests go, we've been so lucky. I mean, I feel like I would, I literally have had every single one. I would put, yes, we'd like to have them back or I good. would recommend them to others. We did have one situation which was nobody's really nobody's fault, but I wasn't sure how it was being dealt with. Um, we had a cancellation because a hurricane was coming in last year. Mm. And I think they were from out of town, Ohio or something. And mm -hmm. so I approved the uh, the cancellation because I think it was right on the edge of when it was the deadline. Yeah. But I didn't want to play that game. I mean, these people were not coming to the, they may. I wasn't even sure they were going to be allowed to come. So I just said, we'll take the loss. Um, and I let yeah. them cancel. And the woman kept reaching out to me saying, I haven't got my money back. Do you know anything? I said, I don't know anything. The money's between you and Airbnb because right. I hadn't been sent any of it. Um, right. They send it to you. I think it's somewhere around the middle of every visit. Yeah. It's like usually day two, you get day your payment. Yeah, I usually get it somewhere in the middle or after yeah. a few days. Um, so I hadn't gotten any money. So it was really between her and Airbnb. And and then Airbnb cut off my ability to, to communicate with them. That's odd. So, so it's strange. But I mean, I don't even want to say that's a, a negative against Airbnb. It just was an instance where I, right. I couldn't follow up. Right. One thing I think works to our advantage is um, I feel like we give really good customer service. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why we've been doing well in our, in our, that's review. why you're getting good reviews. It's all about yeah. responsiveness. And let me tell you, let me tell you, I'm going to give Rob some props here. I'm going to give Rob some props here. He's been in the restaurant business for over 30 years mm -hmm. and um, he kept moving his way up the, the chain until he got to general manager. The reason he got there was because he was so good with customers. He was especially customer good. service. He was yeah. especially good at diffusing customers, especially ones mm -hmm. that were angry or upset. He's always been good at that. And he would back them off the ledge and he would give them a dessert and he would make sure they had a really good experience. They would come back mm -hmm. again. You know? And That's so he's a he, really good skill. He's been able to use that skill so well. It's almost like Airbnb was, was mm -hmm. born, you know? Um, no, it's so a just, huge skill. I'll give him that prop. Because the thing I, is, is you guys are super hosts and so am I. And the reason we're super hosts is we have a really nice product, our houses, and we put a lot of work into it. But it's also how we treat people and our responsiveness. I yeah. always give people early check-in if I can or late checkout. Yes. I'm very personable. You're the same way. 
and that people like us and they like our houses and we're and the thing about being a super host is anyone that's thinking about getting into airbnb you want to strive for that because once you're a super host your listing goes to the top so the mm -hmm. super host listings are promoted um in the forefront um and that's mm -hmm. a reward airbnb does for their super hosts that's and that's a huge deal i'll tell you we, we just got our 19th uh five-star review uh, we've that's never awesome. gotten to, we've never gotten below a five star. We have nine. That's amazing. I mean, yeah. I get a lot of five stars, but I've gotten a little bit below. I mean, I think yeah. my mine is like four point eight eight. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that's so Rob, great. Rob, you guys are Rob has figured out a secret formula to deal with these people to make sure they will give us a five at the end. And what he does is, like he talked about, he gives them waves of information up front. Mm -hmm. Then he touches base with them, like maybe mid stay. Just hey, is everything going okay? Anything yeah. I can do for you? And then he deals with them also on the back end. The other thing he does is he transfers them from Airbnb communication to text message communication. Yes, that's it's huge. Really, that it's too. really important. It's really important. It is. Sometimes, sometimes they feel more comfortable communicating over. Text yes, message. you give them their, your personal cell. I'm here for you. Should you have any questions? And you're yeah. right. That's and there have been times changer. there have been times where I'm trying to explain where you're not allowed to drive the golf cart, where you are. I'll just ask, can I call you? Because I can explain it better than right. I can text it. So, um, but the fact that they have a way to get a hold of me uh, anytime and not relying on the app um, is helpful um, to them and they feel more comfortable. Um, let me give you an example of, of something customer service that I think is easy. Um, what is standard on Oak Island is all the rental companies bring um, bundles of sheets and everything and leave leave them at the front door. And mm -hmm. what I said was, that's crazy. Um, if you're driving in from Ohio and you're arriving at nine o'clock with, with cranky, tired kids, right. you don't want to, you do not want to make beds. Gosh, no. <laughs> you do not want to make beds. So we're one of the only ones on the island who um, goes to a rental company that makes the bed for you. Absolutely. My beds are and, made too. Yeah. Absolutely. It's it's just common sense that absolutely you're trying to have them walk in. They've been slugging their bags. Right. Kids crying, people hungry. Uh, you just want to get settled as fast as you can. Yes. You want to be able to peel it back and it's nice, crisp sheets. Your bed's ready to go. You can crash if you want. You can throw your bags down and head straight out to the beach, whatever you want to do. Um, yes. th those are little touches that are so easy. And yet it's profound um, that it, it puts it puts a premium on the guest experience as opposed to maybe it's a little cheaper for them to just throw you a bundle of sheets. And they don't charge you for yeah. having them made. We pay for the linen service to make it. Oh, so yeah. it's, but it's not that expensive. But well, still, you know what? It's, it's, it's like first impressions are everything, right? So when yeah. someone enters your home, you want them to be like, oh, you know, this is, this is amazing. I immediately can put my bags down and relax. The last yeah. thing you want, like you said, is someone driving a long distance to get there and having to make a freaking bed. I don't even like doing that at my own house and I do, but you know, that's kind of a pain. And if you have to make multiple ones. So that's I think true. that's a very good point. You want it to yeah. be ready, like user right. ready. hundred percent ready. Through the door. Dishes are clean. The place yes. is clean. Looks spotless. Are welcoming. And ready. Yeah. Smells good. Looks good, good. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And what's cool is I have a, uh, a ring doorbell. Mm -hmm. um, so good. I can see arrivals mm -hmm. and what I love is I'll see them their first impression when they open the door oh that is and it's cool. always like oh this is nice you know it's always, <laughs> <laughs> always something positive wow, wow. It is. <laughs> it's positive. I oh pretty God. much try try not to watch the rest of their visit but I want to see who's arriving yeah, no, it's so um, true. I do that too. And the other thing is like thinking about lighting and stuff. So people don't always think like this. Like think about what you would want if you were pulling up to a property you'd never been at before. So for me being on top of a mountain, you know, it mm -hmm. gets dark in the winter. I want to make sure I have a nice 
warm security light that the minute they pull into that driveway is going to turn on so that as they're unpacking, they've got yeah. a bright light. You know what I, like I mean? That. And then as they yeah. go up the stairs to the door, there's a light. I do those. Um, I'm sure you guys know the dusk to dawn bulbs are brilliant. Mm -hmm. So they literally, you screw yeah. them into your light. And as soon as dusk arrives, they turn on and they turn off automatically at dawn. And they're very energy efficient. They've been a game changer for me. That's awesome. Dusk mm -hmm. to dawn bulbs. You know, you know, one of the things we, we do to make really them feel at home. Really good idea, yeah. One of the things we do to make them feel at home is, um, as you know, the Pope family loves to play board games. Oh, We've yeah. Long, long and card games. <laughs> and card games. So we play sequence and we play categories. We yeah. Play cards, cards against Pictionary. Humanity. Pictionary, yeah. So we uh, we also leave a copy of each of those at the property. Yep. Mm -hmm. and we, the same we've, had, thing. we've had people make a comment about how how nice that was to feel like they're at home. They could pop out the sequence game and play right there. Absolutely. You know, and like puzzles. puzzles. And the other thing to your point, that's such a good point, is I have a lot of my books on the bookshelf. And mm -hmm. it's just the honor system. You know, maybe sometimes people take them, but I have a whole array of different subjects. Mm -hmm. And people have said it was really fun to just grab a book and, and chill and read. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I think yeah. the comforts of home is basically when, what we're saying. Make it feel yeah. welcoming get in the door and once they're in the door the comforts of home are there when my yeah. dad and julie went they said their favorite spot in the whole house was the screened in porch I because you go porch. out you go out in the early morning and it's cool it's not hot oh yet. yeah and you have the dew on the grass and you have your book birds in your hand chirping your newspaper and mm -hmm. you have your, you have your coffee we have by the way we have a, a keurig and we have a grinder so we have two different oh. and okay. we have I only just have a coffee maker we also have the air fryer. We've got like everything. So, but they can go out there with their coffee and their newspaper and you hear the birds chirping and you see the squirrel go across the grass. And it's just, it's just wonderful, you know, right there in the back. Absolutely. That's such a good point. And things, the air fryer is actually something that I just added because mm -hmm. it's such a good way to reheat food. And when you're on vacation, a lot of times you are going to get food. And mm -hmm. if you have leftovers, the air fryer is the best way, right? To eat yeah. them again. So it I think every Airbnb has one. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah. Well, last story, and then we're going to go to our presentation. Um, this story, uh, Sarah, was the long-term renter who came in. And I believe that not only is there a code from the owner, us, to the customer, but I believe the customer owes the owner information, too, about what their intentions are. And one time with the long-term renter, we had a very big surprise for Robbie when he was looking through the ring doorbell so tell the story about that right <laughs> they arrived with you u-hauls full of furniture what yeah, yeah. And there's nowhere to put it no they to put moved it. in they moved in all this furniture and we never really understood what had happened you never uh, told that us is bizarre it. yeah did they, they were, not think it was a furnished rental no they knew it was they were building a house in um Asheville. Mm -hmm. And I think, and I think they just temporarily needed to put some yeah. of the furniture. They it wasn't a whole house worth. It wasn't yeah. a whole house worth. It was like a couple couches and something else. So I, I assume they consolidated our couches into a small area and then sort of piled it in. But and he literally, he literally called me and he's like, Tom, you would not believe this, but they've just arrived and a U-Haul has pulled up. <laughs> and then he called me 10 minutes later. He's like, now they're moving a bed in. And then he called oh, me a few minutes later. Now yeah. they're moving a dresser in. I was like, oh my God. Like that's funny. It, it really felt like they, they had crossed a line there. Like they really should have told us what their intentions were. Yeah. I, I don't know. Maybe they, they they took pictures of everything as it was. And she said, We think we returned everything back to its normal place. And there were two things out of place or something, but not not too bad. But I was like, it was a strange experience. It was a little that scary. Is very strange. Watching all this furniture coming to the front door. <laughs> Yeah, that that yeah. I've never heard a story like that. I mean, I'm glad yeah, that it worked out and they got it all out of there. But I um, had a lot of contact with them after that, just to try and figure out what are these people made of. Um, yeah. And they were they were very um, nice they were people, fun. and they, were great. they didn't do anything wrong, and they returned the house to as it was. There was no damage. All um, I know is they must have been very crowded in there because. <laughs> oh my gosh! Yeah. 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 I what? I do know that they were selling. The daughters, you, I mean, um, uh, camper. Yeah. Um, I don't know if that was related to it somehow. 
I don't know, but um, we got back there and it was fine. So we got really lucky. <laughs> well, let's take a look at some of the information I've put together. I want to get both of you guys take on this stuff. Um, there's a lot of good stuff here for anybody who's considering owning an Airbnb. So let's take a look. So Sarah, this is our episode 17. I can't believe it, but we're finally at 17 and how to That's run great. a successful, successful and profitable Airbnb. We mentioned earlier some of the other companies other than Airbnb you can look at if you want to put your short-term rental on. Booking.com, I mentioned, is some people's favorites. VRBO, who Sarah and we have not had any success with, but certainly they're a partner with Expedia. Uh, Homestay.com, I mentioned earlier um, to Sarah that one of my colleagues at work has a property at Myrtle Beach, and they have their property on Airbnb and Homestay.com. Homestay.com is a very low-fee provider, and so they've been trying to um, – steer people towards homestay.com because you get to keep a lot more of the rent. And, and just so just Airbnb while fees. this is up, while you have this up, it's important to um, tell anybody who might be thinking about um, starting uh, an Airbnb situation. Um, you can link all the calendars. Yes. So yes that, you can. So that a rental goes to all of them at the same time, mm -hmm. which is really important to do. So you don't double book by accident. That's a really strong point. And I remember, Rob, you and I struggled at first to learn how to do that, but we finally did link them all. So that was really great. Yes. Good point. So I just mentioned homestay.com. TripAdvisor and Agoda are both travel sites, kind of like Expedia, but they do allow short-term rentals to be on their sites. So these are all really good possible options for you. So let's talk about the 10 tips for running a successful Airbnb. I want to get you guys' take on these. First ones are in the short-term category. It's all about location, location, location. You know, uh, Sarah's found two great locations uh, to rent. We found a great one at the beach. It sounds like she's got a third in Maine, right on the um, snowboarding trail or, or, or snowmobiling trail, I guess you said it was. Yeah. Um, but I would assume that if you pick a location in the middle of nowhere, not near anything anybody wants to visit, you might have a real struggle trying to rent, right? I actually have a friend who's in Pennsylvania and it's a very rural part of Pennsylvania with not a lot of, not a lot of tourist attractions nearby. And he did put it on Airbnb and he has not had one booking. So mm -hmm. it could be pricing. It could be location, but I actually recommended for him to do something called furnish finder, which is travel nurses mm -hmm. and travel um, mm -hmm. medical professionals because he oh, does have idea. quite a few hospitals near him and he does need the additional income but with airbnb i think you're going to be most successful like i said earlier is if you have something that really draws people in recreational the beach mm -hmm. the mountains mm -hmm. vineyards something that's going to draw people to want to stay there and if you're in the I middle of the nowhere, there's other things you could think about i think to simplify it you should be able to explain in a sentence why somebody would want to rent there yeah. So, and that's usually located to a location to something, to the mountains, mm -hmm. to the beach, to concert yeah. venue, to right, um, maybe a wedding venue. Mm -hmm. Some something location wise uh, would be one of the main players in in why you would rent your place. Completely agree. Yeah, I agree too. Number two is get a property that presents beautifully in pictures. So um, I, I know that I have a friend who just bought a place down near Charleston that was a fixer upper, Sarah. So he didn't listen to your your recommendation. <laughs> and, uh, but he said that it it's much nicer in person and he and his wife can't figure out how to get it to look good in pictures. And I think that's a struggle because really your one chance to lure an Airbnb renter in is your place does need to present beautifully in pictures. What are your guys thoughts on this? I would add to that, and this is the realtor in me, I would pay to have professional photos taken. Okay. Um, that was a game changer with me yeah. with Wintergreen. My pictures, even though the phones take such fantastic photos now, you don't think you might need. If right. you've got kind of a big complex property, I would pay for professional photos. You're yeah. Actually, I have to say, Sarah, you know, we've almost stayed at your Wintergreen house a couple of times, but it hadn't happened yet. But I have to say that when I looked at your listing yesterday, I was blown away. Those photos are fantastic. And it's because the professional photos, because if right. you could have seen the ones I took when I first put it on, they were mm -hmm. nowhere near as good. Yeah. So thank you for well, saying that. And it was worth the money. It was like 300 bucks. Well spent. They really yeah. pop. 
They're really it's powerful. one of the most important things when you're getting started. Um, I I was told that by our management company. Uh, the first thing that he focused on was get good pictures. And we, so coming into this um, uh, podcast tonight, in my head, I remember saying, make sure you mention how important it is to get good pictures. Mm -hmm. And so it might seem frivolous to get a photographer. Hey, I can take great pictures with my cell phone. You can, but they're using a lens that actually makes the rooms look bigger um mm -hmm. brighter brighter colors um, they're using a flash that's nowhere near what we could ever have on our phone yeah. and their pixels are about three times yeah. what a phone it's is. worth that is the number one yeah. thing to do is there are some there are some tape. angles there are some angles in our pictures that make the rooms look even bigger than they are and they actually are pretty nice size rooms yeah it it, it actually allows your mind to see the space in such a way that it's 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 spectacular. So um, I think, yeah, spending the money on a professional photographer is well worth it. You only have to do it really once. Yeah. And I've actually added some of my own little photos in mm -hmm. and I put them towards the back, like of the golf cart of the hot I did tub. the same thing. Yeah. Um, you add it toward the back after yeah. the impressiveness is already in place. Um, you can go ahead and add some of your own, but the, 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 you need to grab your customer who's thinking about your place or another place. You know, they're trying to decide mm -hmm. um, the beautiful photos, making your place look as good as humanly possible could mm -hmm. make the difference between getting that renter. And it's interesting. Totally uh, the only the only photos we have on our property that are not uh, professionally taken and are from a phone or of our hot tub and our golf cart. Which is fine. <laughs> and, yeah. and you yeah. can actually, but you can actually tell the difference. They're, they are fine, mm -hmm. but sure. you can really tell the difference. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. at the same time, the perfect angle for them wasn't necessary because it's just a hot tub. Like you're not going right. to try and make it right. look bigger than it is, or you're not worried about lighting. You know, it's they're at the tail end of the slideshow. Um, you've already made up your mind on whether it's nice, you know. So right. and then oh cool this and oh cool that. So you can you can add your own photos in, but I think it's a huge mistake people who try to take their own photos of the majority of their property. Definitely. I agree. I agree with that. Number three, price your property correctly by season and market the property to everyone you know. Sarah, what are your thoughts on these about pricing and marketing? Pricing is key. I mean, once again, with my realtor hat on, it's all about location, 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 obviously. The photos are key, but then the price is where, I mean, you could have the most beautiful property on the whole site, but if it's overpriced, people are probably still not going to rent it. So that's mm -hmm. why I'm a big believer in the smart pricing. And I'm also a big mm -hmm. believer, let Airbnb use all their algorithms to do the work for you. You mm -hmm. know the minimum that you want to accept. Let them then mm -hmm. go out and look at all the other things on the market and help you get it booked. And the other thing I do is, for example, I don't have bookings for two weekends in June at Wintergreen. So I went mm -hmm. in just the other day and lowered the price by mm -hmm. about $75 a night for the mm -hmm. Friday and Saturday night timeframes. Cause that's mm -hmm. when mine's typically booked. Okay. That's great. And what about marketing the property to everyone, you know? Yes. Don't think that you shouldn't put it on Facebook and say, Hey, I just, you know, I've even said, I'm a, I'm so proud to be a super host for the third year in a row. If anyone's looking for a getaway in the mountains, you know, this is such a great property. And then included my listing link. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and for me too, as a realtor, I market that, hey, I have a lot of experience with Airbnb. And as a super host, let me help you find an Airbnb. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And one other thing yeah. you can do, um, we added a Facebook page um to uh we created a facebook entry for the house oh that's a great idea so yeah, really people cool. can upload their own photos we can upload lots of updated photos and new when we take new trips and stuff so that's kind of cool too like and then that. Everyone, yeah everyone can see the page through my page and through tom's page so it's its own page but it like links to us and I tell Rob all the time, especially for the uh, times of the year where it doesn't rent as readily. I mean, mm -hmm. you can't just sit back and let Airbnb be your only marketing channel. You no. really have to 
And I talk it up all the time. People at work, I talk to pe everyone I know. I talk to people on the pickleball court. Hey, you're looking for a beach house? Uh, you know, just just promote it. Don't be obnoxious about it, but talk it up. Think of it. I mean, it is your business. And, you mm -hmm. know, when you think of when you hear about all the things that three of us are doing to promote our business, it's definitely a, another job, but it's a very rewarding mm -hmm. job and it can yeah. be a really nice extra income. And there are mm -hmm. people that quit their full time job and they have multiple Airbnbs that they run and they, had, they duplicate that income. We've had so much fun with it. We really have. Yeah. Stuff. Yeah. It's been it's been a blast. So uh, the other benchmark that they say for uh, kind of profitability within the Airbnb space is making sure you can rent it at least 70 percent occupancy. So I don't know, Sarah, what have you seen kind of your break even? So point on your I'm property? trying to think if I've ever gotten that high with mine. It's typically a weekend rental because it is a bit out of the way being on the top of a mountain. But mm -hmm. if you figure it's rents, I feel like I'm doing well if I can have every single weekend booked. And mm -hmm. then a lot of times around holidays, I do have a big chunk of the week booked as well. And then sometimes in the summer, I'll get families booking it for like a week at a time. So I don't know if it has to be, I mean, God, 70% I would love, but I still think you can do very well if it's not at 70%, but it depends mm -hmm. on, it also depends on what your nightly rate is. So wintergreen's a little bit higher because it sleeps so many people. So I right. can get away with just doing weekends. That is true. Um, but yeah, I do think it's important to have your own benchmarks. Think about the other thing to think about the way I look at it with running a business is, what is my break even? Because I know what I paid for it. I know what I put into it. But what does it cost me every year to run this house? Do I have a mortgage? What is that? What are my utilities? What are my property taxes? What are my HOAs? So once I pay all that, what do I want to make on top of that yeah. to have, you know, be my... In other words, in other words what's your viability point, right? And maybe right. it's 50%. Maybe it's 50% for you at Wintergreen or whatever it right. is. But like, I think we hit 70%. 30%. I think we hit 70% because of the long-term renter this year. That's, the only That's huge. Yes. Because 70%, but, I would say is very high. That's great. Mm -hmm. And I do think the long-term rental helped you get to that. Right. Yeah. No question. No doubt about it. All right. Number five is add amenities. So hot tubs, golf carts, pool tables, bocce courts. Uh, it sounds like you've got cornhole on the way. Um, what are pool some table. other amenities? What are some other amenities, Sarah, you've seen work? Hot tub for sure. If I could swing it, I would put a hot tub at Wintergreen um, because people coming in from skiing would love it. Mm -hmm. um, it's something I kind of made the decision that I had done so much renovation. It wasn't something I could swing financially at this time. But I think the fact that you guys have the hot tub, um, you're thinking about the bocce court that's only going to make you more because people want those things. I know that houses mm -hmm. with hot tubs at Wintergreen do tend to rent more than houses without hot tubs mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah. We, yeah, were told that even... by our, we, were, we were told that by our rental company that um, the, the houses that have hot tubs rent well in the winter, the ones that don't are a ghost ghost town. So mm -hmm. he said it's, it's everything. Um, yeah. That's what they're looking for in the winter because they want some kind of water experience Yeah, um, and they'll go to the beach, but they're not getting in the ocean. Right. So they, they'd happily get in the hot tub. Like we've, we, we like going there in November uh, when it's starting to get cold at night. So mm -hmm. we have a, a we have a, a really cool, um, uh, what do you call it? P fire pit. And we get that thing blazing away We'll sit there and we'll do s'mores and drink beers and then we'll jump up and we'll go jump in the hot tub. Yeah, that we'll sounds great. We'll go yeah, back to the, the fire pit and, you know, it's a different experience than in the summer when, you know, the fire pit doesn't get used as much as you might think. Right. No, I so, totally agree. I think other amenities you could consider if you had a bigger home, or maybe even a small backyard pool. Might be an option. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah, in Florida, the pool. the pool is key for Airbnbs. You have to have a pool in Florida. Right. Yeah. You know, we, well, you don't have to, but you can be near the beach, et cetera. But it definitely helps to have like the lanai with the pool. Another thing we added was a um a chest that we have on the front in the inside the front railing. And it's full of beach toys, mm -hmm. um, balls, um, Boogie Frisbee. boards, 
frisbees. It's got these little um, surfer dude things that are really cool. They're like little um, like wooden floating surfers. Oh, yeah, I know what you're talking about. And yep. you throw them out in the ocean and they come surfing back in. They're really fun for yeah, kids. Yeah, those are cool. Yeah. Uh, we have all kinds of stuff like that in there and it's open and everyone just grab whatever you want for the beach that day and throw it on the golf cart and go. And uh, I think that's really thinking about the whole experience as well, too, because you might arrive there and have no you're not a beach person, really. You don't have much in the way of beach equipment or yeah, or what have you. That's great. You do that. Yeah. Let's take a look at some of the long term uh, items here. Number six is target appreciating properties and understand the market. What are your thoughts here? Um, yeah, I think that it's important if you're going to be investing in a property that you want to run as an Airbnb, that you have to be in a market that's a rising market or at least a comfortable, healthy market that's maybe not rising, but it's it's not decreasing. And um, mm -hmm. so that gets back to location. But I do think that mm -hmm. it's important because you want to be in a desirable area that people want to be coming to. Um, mm -hmm. And that's also important because you're making a very expensive, you know, a property is expensive and you're making a big investment here. So you have to mm -hmm. treat it as if you almost have to treat it as if you're buying a house that, you know, you want to own for a while. And that could be potentially a house you would live in someday, because if you just think of it as this is just going to be my rental, um, I think it's really important to think of it like for a long term purchase. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it, it kind of reminds me of something related to Oak Island. <clears throat> um, one interesting thing, it, it's kind of, it's really important to understand the, the dynamic of the area where you're buying, the future of your area. For instance, um, Oak Island faces south. The whole island is, is Long Island that faces south. So mm -hmm. what's cool is the sun rises on one side and, and it sets on the other. But more important than that is the currents. It's it's important to understand the currents. All the south facing beaches do really well with sand erosion, and because the sand comes down from the north and and sort of settles, and so we don't have a huge problem with beach erosion. Um, yeah. Whereas I'm not going to name names of a couple of beaches just north of us that are facing east. They get eroded a lot, and some of them have had to settle for the sand dunes disintegrating to the point where they've had to build them up with sandbags. It's just not a beautiful situation. Wow. And yeah. literally, yeah, that's a good point. literally, Sarah, he's exactly right. And what happens in those beach towns is actually their properties are either flatlining or going down. They're going yeah. down in value because their beachfront is, is going away. The only way to combat that is to dredge millions and millions of dollars to dredge sand just to, just to hang on to what you got. Mm -hmm. um, so if you pick wisely and you pick beachfront that is going to at least maintain itself, if not build, um, that's an incredible investment that 10 years from now, it's pretty predictable that you'll be in good shape. You can't, you can't predict hurricanes, right? but you can predict that normal erosion is going to really not be such a factor. There's a yeah. couple, couple of beaches that face South that all have the same advantage, um, and so those are really good areas to look for, you know. Yeah. So interesting, and interesting enough, there's actually areas on Oak Island that are even better than other areas on Oak Island that get more sand, like down at the point. So it's it's just interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. Number seven, pull capital back out to buy more properties. We mentioned this a little bit earlier as a major strategy. If you want to continue to buy your second, third and fourth Airbnb. One way to do it is to sit in your mortgage for at least a year and then pull capital back out. So what are you guys' thoughts about this? So I just did this, um, and I think it's a, a great strategy. If you buy smart and you buy something in an area that's appreciating, as Rob was just talking about, often your equity is going to grow. And I took a home equity line of credit out on my primary residence, and I used that to buy the place in Maine. Okay. So mm -hmm. it's a great awesome. strategy. You know, the rate's going to probably be a little bit lower maybe um, than other ways of, you know, accessing funds to buy and the equity's there. 
And I think it's a great use of your equity to be buying something else that you can then invest in and hopefully make some money on. Did you learn, did you use any particular vendor that you've always used or did you shop around? Um, I actually went through the bank that I had my checking and savings account with because they didn't charge me an appraisal fee or any closing okay. costs. Awesome. And that was a great way to go. It's just Citizens Bank is who I went through. Very cool. We have a couple of lenders we like to work with and we, we're kind of probably going to work with at least two or three of them, see who has the better yeah. deal. Yeah, shop things around yeah. a bit. That's right. Well, number eight, keep expenses low and consider tax write-offs. Uh, so what are you doing, Sarah, on your properties to try to keep expenses as low as possible to kind of maximize your profit? Um, you know, I just, I'm really aware of, I was, the, the key thing for me was having a really excellent cleaning person because I'm far away and I mm -hmm. don't go in after each guest. So she's very reasonable. I don't have a property manager because she almost does the job of a property manager. And because I am a realtor, I'm so used to being constantly on phone and email that mm -hmm. I, and Rob sounds like he's great at it too. I'm managing mm -hmm. the guests myself. And then she's my eyes there to go in and let me know how things um, are after the guests check out. And so that's saved me quite a bit by just having a real right-hand person that not only is cleaning, but kind of keeping her eye on the property. Um, I always make sure to like, you have to stock the Airbnb with things like toilet paper and paper towels mm -hmm. and dish soap and pods. And, you know, I try to be smart about buying those. I, I use Amazon prime and I do the order like four times a year. And then I really treat, you know, sh I shop around for landscaping and assistance with that. Um, and I really act as if, you know, it is my home, but it's almost like I treat it like my primary home. I shop around for things. I try mm -hmm. to make sure it's well-maintained, but I'm getting different quotes on things if something needs to be prepared. And then having a really good accountant, obviously. Um, and mm -hmm. I think that's going to be another bullet point. I'm um, helping you with like, what are the potential write-offs that you can have? Yeah, I think Rob and I have done everything we can to keep expenses as low as we can. Um, obviously, we need a management company right now just because we're too far away. Yeah. Mm -hmm. each. Um, and, but I know everything Rob and I talk about is, can we write this off? Is this mm -hmm. a tax? Yeah. Can we write this off? Absolutely. But I and think not that only that, but even when you have a management company, um, I feel like we really keep hands on quite a lot. I'm pretty sure that our management company does not have another uh, tenant or owner that they deal with that is as hands-on as we are. It sounds like you are, yeah, much more than most. I'm going to go in there and, and lay eyes on stuff. And I'm going to realize, you know, I was there a couple weekends ago, touch up painting the front and back door, mm -hmm. just little tiny things that keep it looking nice and fresh yes. and everything. And then he goes in and he does stuff like he'll change the air filter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And he'll, so we're both tag teaming it. And, um, and therefore there's less to worry about. We're going to, we're going to catch when something is, is off, you know, Yeah. Um, we're laying eyes on it. I'm, I'm doing it as much as I can. He's there all the time. And now he kind of knows what my standard is. So I think he, he, he tries to live to that um, and to meet me where I am. Um, but yeah, just because you have a good property manager or a good, whatever, I still think keep your hands on as much as you can so that um, the standard is is clear for everybody involved yes. and and you can um, catch problems as they're happening or before. Um, we had a little bit of a loose toilet paper holder and we tried to fix it and it wouldn't. So anyway, I think if, if you're not aware of those tiny little things um, and catching them early, they'll, they'll linger and then they'll end up, they'll end up showing up in a bad review or a mediocre review because yeah. things, things appear to be broken, you know? Right. Um, yeah. And you have to realize, Sarah, we're a, about two years behind you in development of this business, yes. right? So for yeah. us, it was, it was more important to get the five-star reviews and get to the super host. Absolutely. Static. And yeah. you were um, smart. Yeah. You but we, so we smart. imagine, we imagine in the future when we've got four or five beach houses, mm -hmm. um, and when Rob retires one day, he'd like to do right. full time. So yes. yeah, oh, yeah. So, so we're that's looking. What people at, do, yeah. We're looking at this as you know, we'll be owners and management company. Management. Absolutely, you will. Yeah, so that's kind of the goal. 
Number nine, uh, get a great management company and cleaning service. We were just mentioning this uh, in detail, but uh, what are your thoughts here, Sarah? I know that you've been able to get away with not having a management company in Wintergreen, but what yeah, about and I mean, part? obviously, in the one in Laconia, because I'm here, I'm actually going to do the cleaning myself. I'm mm -hmm. one of those people that actually loves cleaning. I find it very therapeutic. So that that's only a one bedroom, you know, maybe the pull out couch. That's a lot more yeah. manageable. Wintergreen can, Brittany's doing, you know, five, six beds. I don't know if I'd want to take that on. She's got a system. Mm -hmm. She's got helpers. But here I could do the cleaning myself. But it is, it's definitely just depends on your market, whether you need management company or not. And mm -hmm. it makes total sense to have them because you're right. The most important thing is to have the best possible experience for the guest. And, and how far away you are, right? Um, exactly. My, my daughter, Tori, has a friend down in Wilmington who has three of them, three, yeah. three Air, Airbnbs. And um, they live in the top floor of one of the three of them. Yeah. And the, the other two, they just manage and clean themselves. So right. If you and, live close and, by, yeah. you, don't, you don't need it. Yeah. So, all right. Uh, number 10, start to dream about scaling your business. So... You know, whether you're going to be adding additional properties, whether you're going to maybe be getting into more commercial related properties or duplexes, there's all kinds of ways this could go. So what are you guys thoughts about scaling your business? I mean, people have had so much success with this. It, you figure, you know, depending on what you're making per year for one, if you multiply that by four, you can see how people are replacing their income. It is mm -hmm. a lot of work. It's not easy and it's not for everyone. You have to be incredibly on the ball and responsive and organized mm -hmm. and detailed. And But I mean, all of us are like that anyway. And why not have that as your goal? I mean, I would love to retire knowing that I had three or four successful Airbnbs that I really enjoyed running mm -hmm. and I had had a great career in real estate, but now I was going to just focus on the Airbnbs, you know, in my whatever, 60s or 70s. I think um, you're you're well on your way, Sarah, <laughs> to get in there. <laughs> I always joke that I'll be showing houses with a walker at 80, like pushing the walker. But <laughs> hopefully that will not happen. <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> That's great. All right. Well, let's look at some uh, tips here on how to achieve super host status. And I don't know how long it took you, Sarah. It took us about six months to get there. Yeah, I think it took but me about six months, too. But this was just changed about three weeks ago. I don't know if you've seen these latest uh, ratings. This is how you achieve Super Bowl uh, super host status as of May 2024. You have to have an overall rating of 4.8 or more over your first year. Maintain a 50% review rate or higher. Maintain a 90% response rate or higher. Uh, have at least 10 five-star ratings and 10 book guest trips or successfully complete three long-term reservations that total mm -hmm. at least 100 and you need to manage your calendar effectively, and you need to have fewer than three customer complaints to Airbnb. So uh, what are your thoughts about this latest version of their super host status? It's not easy. You know, not everybody can do this, but if you can work your business so that you can be a super host and maintain that, that is the number one thing you can do. Because like I said, you're going to get more exposure your guests are going to be more prone to book with you because you're so seasoned and have such a good success rate. So that should be someone's goal from the get-go. And it does take, a, you know, six to 12 months to do. But what mm -hmm. I think I'm most proud of is that I've maintained it for three years. That's a big deal to me because it's not that easy. Is. You have to be extremely on the ball. But this yeah, is, great. if you're treating this as a business to your point that you want to scale and like add more and more on, this should be your number one thing that you do every day. You know, you have to work this business every day. We all have other jobs, but this is one of my jobs and I work it every day. And my goal mm -hmm. is to always be a super host. Mm -hmm. um, that's and great. that's how you're successful with this. Another cool tool we haven't used yet because we haven't gotten to three properties yet, but it's this tool called Breezeway, which is a service you can order through Airbnb once you get to three properties or more listed. And it allows you to transfer over your super host status across all of your properties. So essentially, and, yeah, if you bought a, so if you cool. bought a new one, if you bought a new one, you would immediately list it under super host status, and it would go to the top of the list. Under and I would list. say I was shocked because <laughs> I only have two right now, and they allowed me to put the super host status on the really? one I just yes. 
Oh, wow. So oh, even though cool. I only have one review, because I've only had one guest so far, I literally just put this out there. When you look at my listing, it says super host for three years. Oh, huh. okay. Yeah. Well, good for so, you. I guess, I guess you don't need Breezeway. <laughs> yeah, it does yeah. it. That's great. Rob, what are your thoughts on Superhost and what it took us to get there? So what I would say is um, it definitely, it felt like something that we were building towards. And the other thing I would say is none of those criteria by themselves is very challenging or difficult. Right. Um, it just took some work. But I think getting all of those and then hitting Superhost was an achievement. And uh, we we're proud of it. And I think it's not so easy to always keep your um, customer service level where it never dips below 4.8 or, um, you know, you have your pricing right so that you have at least three rentals that equal a hundred days. So you're having long-term renters, which means you're not gouging people. You're, you're charging a reasonable price. Um, so you're keeping your pricing right. You're taking good care of your guests. You're responding to any problems that come up so that it doesn't right. end up being a bad um review um that's been the key is occasionally there'll be some kind of issue and you fix it and you're pleasant about it and you still get a five star um right. because they appreciate the service um you remember, you remember we, we had we had situations like they couldn't get in the front door yeah uh, they i've had they those too we had the washer mm -hmm. not work one time yeah the washer wasn't working we've had all kinds of stuff and and again i attribute this to Rob's ability to do high touch with customers. I really do. Well, I was just yeah. going to say that, Tom, yeah. that the hardest bullet on there is the maintaining a 90% response rate. There are only certain people that can take that on. And Rob and I are in careers and you too, Tom, yeah. where we have to be that way in our career. Yeah. But if you're someone that has a very, very busy day job, and you just don't know if you're going to be able to respond. I mean, when that Airbnb app dings, you got to respond. So in that case, you might want to hire someone to help you do that responding. Mm -hmm. You know, that's I, the key I, thing. You know, I looked, Sarah, back in my personal history, and I've been renting Airbnbs for 12 years as a customer. Yeah. And I, I went and looked. I just preparing for this program two days ago, I went and looked, and I had only given less than a five-star twice. And in both cases the host that I was trying to contact before, during, and after the stay was completely incommunicata. That's the worst <laughs> like, thing you can I, do. I just would never get a yeah. response in any situation. And that's the number one worst thing you could do. And it wasn't even really that I didn't like the place or that it was right. really bad. Right. It just, I felt so burned by the fact that they just wouldn't respond. Right. And you have to respond yeah. right away and give them your personal cell. And I've never had an issue with that. I'll give you an example. Um, right before we came on, we got a new rental uh, at the end of August, um, which was still open. And uh, because August is one of the best rental months, but it actually tails off right at the end because yeah. everyone goes back to school. <laughs> right. So part of it, it feels like, you know, incredibly warm, hot summer. And the, and the other feels like, OK, we hit fall. It's going to slow down now. Right. Um, but anyway, so that's a difficult week to rent and she rented it. So I was really excited. So I, I, I had to respond, even though I was in the middle of this um, getting getting going with us. Um, it's important that you, you, you're you timely with it. Mm. You tell them you're excited they're coming. You're really happy that they um, are, are, are renting through you, et cetera. And any, any questions, feel free to, you know, looking forward to seeing you soon. And then you just leave it there. And then you let the time get closer. But now they have a good feeling about going on and, and renting um, because they probably exactly. looked at several places. Um, so, And it's interesting. It, Rob, Rob, a couple of times has had times where he does the thing he always does. He reaches out to them. We're really excited about you coming, you know, two days ahead of time. They don't respond. Then after they check in, they don't respond. So he's had, had a couple of times where the customer is incommunicado. Yes, I've come. had that too. Yep. And and, he, and it, he doesn't like that either because then it, you don't know if they're having a good time. You don't know. If right. Yeah. Yep. And a, a lot of times those people give us a five star review, but then you look at the review itself and it's like one sentence. You know, we had a really right. good yeah, time. Yeah. They're just You're busy like, in there. Yeah. <laughs> so, it's so true. And that's you know, okay. This, but... I look at this had fewer than three customer complaints to Airbnb. We haven't had one yet. I haven't and either. I, I'm, I'm knocking on wood right now. I'm knocking on wood. I am too. Know. 
But what, what are your thoughts about how you're going to handle? Because invariably, if you're in this business long enough, it will happen, right? So how, well, there's some people that you just can't please. I only had yeah. one situation. He didn't actually file a complaint, but he was frustrated because I was still having some work done uh, two summers ago. And I let people know. I said, the inside of the house is perfect. Unfortunately, we had some rain delays and the and the deck guys are going to be there and they're just going to be finishing up. I hope that's okay. As long as you tell people, usually it's fine because yeah. they're not yeah. hanging out under the deck. Yeah. Um, but this particular guy was difficult and he was not happy about that. And he yeah. said that, you know, it wasn't, it didn't look the way he'd wanted it to look. And he was there with a bunch of baseball dads and basically was saying, he almost threatened me. He said, if you don't knock some money off, I'm going to make a complaint. And I got a little prickly, but I just, sometimes you just say, fine. And I just said, I'll knock, you know, I'll yeah. take the cleaning fee off, yeah, yeah. which is $200 because sure. it's a bigger house. And then he was fine. He was just okay. looking for an angle to get some money off. And you're going to get people like that sometime. Right. But the va that's the only time out of 90 people that right. that's ever happened. Right. Well, hopefully it never happens to either one of us. <laughs> yes, I don't think it will. All right. So strategy for year one of your Airbnb. This is what Rob and I are just wrapping up our year one. Uh, I don't know if you remember your year one exactly, Sarah, but. These are kind of the, the suggestions that uh, come from the industry when you're learning in your first year. First one is learn, learn, learn. Assume that the first year you'll find out what works and what doesn't and then adjust just like any other small business. What are your thoughts here about the learning process? Yeah, I think that's completely right. And I, I would add partner with a super host. So I partnered with a friend of mine who had a place on Wintergreen and she was okay. my mentor. So find okay. a super host mentor or a mentor in Airbnb, you know, that's had some good experience with it. And she did everything from teaching me how to put the listing in to what should I order from Amazon to make sure it's well stocked. Makes sense. What are your thoughts, Rob? What, what did we learn in year one? Well, in, in our case, it was, it was um, not so much a mentoring situation, but more of a partnership that we formed with um, a management company. Um, I feel like our management um, company uh, representative that we're dealing with, that we deal with, Connor, um, he he helped us in a lot of ways um, learn more about the island, um, bridge some of the gaps we had in our knowledge level of how things work. Um, it helped us decide when we wanted to veer from the norm, like making the beds seemed so logical and we had to talk our way through that to get to where we said, no, 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 we don't want to do what everyone else is doing. We want clean sheets on beds ready to go for people coming in. Um, it kind of took somebody to tell us about what the norms are for us to understand that we can do better than what the norms are. Um, and uh, so that partnership has been very important for us getting started. Um, I feel like a lot of the customer service didn't necessarily come from what we were learning from him. Uh, but more was more about what you and I um, just generally have as our operating, um, mm -hmm. you know, way of doing things. But um, he was good for knowledge. So I think in that way, Sarah's right. Uh, getting some kind of mentor, somebody who's done it before, somebody who's around that can help guide you when you're not sure about something or can um, tell you about things. He he definitely played up the the importance of getting the professional uh, photog uh, photography photography. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, he, he kept us away from making mistakes. He, he praised us when we were getting the pricing, right. Um, you know, he had other properties that were going lower and they were really having, um, shady renters. Uh, mm -hmm. and he said, you guys are staying above that level where they're willing to pay it, but you're at the low end of what all the wealthier people will pay. So, um, you're going to stay full. And so we've been mm -hmm. kind of listening to his him giving us affirmations. You're exactly um, right. What we what we really learned from him was the photography, like you mentioned, but mainly about the island because Oak Island has mm -hmm. a lot of unique aspects about it. Uh, not mm -hmm. only does it have two bridges on two different sides, but it has different zones and areas that we needed to learn. We needed to learn where we could drive the golf cart, where we couldn't. Uh, there was just a lot of little tips he gave us about the island because it is mm -hmm. very unique. So that was really cool. Uh, he also is the one who nudged us towards getting the hot tub. We were kind of on the fence whether we were going to do it or not. Mm -hmm. He definitely talked us into that because we wanted to be able to rent it year round. So that was uh, yeah. that was a big deal. 
So uh, number two is plan for a first year loss. So most Airbnbs are not profitable until year two. It takes a while for you to work out your business model and pricing, get your house on the map and known. What's your thought here? Um, I didn't have a first year loss, but I definitely made more my second year. Okay. I always wanted to be able to cover my expenses, my mortgage and taxes and insurance. And, and I did that and made a little bit more. And then the second year made even a little bit more. And hopefully this year we'll make even a little bit more. So yes, I mean, it's like anything you're learning. You're maybe not going to make as much in the first year. I don't know if it's necessarily going to be a loss, but you're definitely become hopefully more and more profitable as you get more and more adept at running your Airbnb. Yeah. And I think our loss, we did have a loss, but it was pretty narrow. It was a small yeah. loss. And I think we did have a loss because we did add some things to the house. Like right. We you were putting about. in some expensive, you know, the hot tub yeah. is not cheap. Yeah. And so the we were able to cover, cheap. We were able to cover the mortgage, but we weren't able to cover everything that we added. Right. To the house. So, yeah. Which is pretty normal. Mm -hmm. For sure. Any thoughts here, Rob, about our first year loss and and kind of preparing for it? Yeah, I mean, prepare for trying to get the amenities in there that you want that are a draw for your house. Try to make it as nice as you can. Um, get your operational expenses under control and, and get yourself into a pattern where year two is going to go better. A lot of your big stuff's out of the way, you know. So. so another good suggestion, stay at the house on occasion. Uh, of course, we love to do that. Anytime it's not rented, we sprint down there as fast as we can. <laughs> but um, act like you're the customer. You know, determine what you mm -hmm. would want from the experience. What would you want if you were just a paying customer? And it really gives you some good teachings. What are you guys' thoughts here? I just did this in March. I went down for a bunch of lacrosse games to Virginia, and I ended up like moving furniture around and buying some extra things on Marketplace to make certain rooms more comfortable, more, you know, user-friendly for lack of a better, better word. So it was really good to stay there. And I ended up like reorganizing all the drawers because renters are always going to move things around. And I yeah. reorganized everything back, like all the utensils in the right drawers. And, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, I think you needed to usually, you need to do that about once a year. Actually, yeah. interesting you say that, Sarah. How often do you inventory? Because I know one thing Rob and I do every single time we go is we inventory yeah. glasses and utensils and everything. I don't get to go as much because it's so far away, but I do try to go down there at least a couple times a year and stay for you know at least a few days because it's such a far drive. And I go through everything, every cabinet, every drawer, and just make sure you know that nothing has been taken, but more importantly that it's then reorganized so that it's mm -hmm. very um, easy for the guests to access what they would need. Mm -hmm. For sure. So I have three thoughts on this. Um, first of all, the, um, the last renter we had decided to rearrange a few things. And so I kind of was looking around and I, I ended up liking what they did. You know, they kind of rearranged some of the, um, counter space. It was a little more efficient the way they had it. So I, I left it and I kind of mm -hmm. liked it that way. And I realized there's always a better way to do things sometimes. Um, another thing is that we realize staying there that, uh, two of our bedrooms are off this one little area. Um, so you walk through a, 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 a doorway and then they split left and right is bedrooms. And then the bathrooms in the middle. And what we realized is that we, should put up a uh, a barn door there to help mute some of the sound so that if you want to stay up uh, playing games or doing something with a little bit of noise to it, little ones uh, aren't going to be as affected. So um, the noise would go through two doors at that point. So it'll stay quieter in their room. So we added uh, the barn door to help um, that just slides across when you want it to be quieter. And um, there's a, a distinct uh, kids room that has double bed bunks. Um, they're, they're doubles. And uh, that's where all the kids always stay. And so uh, adding the barn door was a function of experiencing, hey, we got to keep it down because the kids, you know, are sleeping, et cetera. But we realized families are going to be in there in this situation a lot. So we went on and, and bit the bullet and had the um, barn door installed. 
And that was some work, but it, it it's going to be good in the long run. It mm -hmm. makes that room, those two rooms form like a suite now. And um, the third one was, uh, we had a weird, staying there, we heard a weird noise. And it was just this, this racket on the on the roof and i was trying to figure it out i figured out it was a it was a woodpecker mm -hmm. and uh and so i did some research and i found out that woodpeckers like to attack houses in two different ways one is to hit the wood um to chew up the wood in the area uh, i think they're looking for bugs um and to also make noise it's a mating call the other thing is to go to metal roofs and just peck at them and make noise and so what I realized with our metal roof was he wasn't damaging anything. He was just making noise. So And, and making noise both for mating call, but also for domination, right? It's more like a territory. Yeah, he, that's how they mark their territories. They make noise. And so other males stay out of the area. So yeah. I was swinging at him with a, with a broom to just, and I haven't seen him since, um, because they, they don't want to have to compete for their space. So um, hopefully we got rid of them. But I don't know that I would have known what, what our customers are going through unless I had had been staying there when the woodpecker was going crazy on the roof. So mm -hmm. um, that, that's just... what ironically, Sarah, Rob had this same problem in Raleigh at his, at his regular house. Oh, well, that's woodpecker funny. Problem. Yeah. 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 When we first moved in. So number four, take constructive criticism. Hopefully all you guests give you five-star reviews, but if they don't take what they say and try to improve your home with it. What are your thoughts yeah. about? Yeah, sometimes you'll have a guest that leaves you just like private comments, and mm -hmm. usually it's it's great information. You know, I had someone say you should have a safety grab bar in the first floor bathroom shower because that's often where the older guests are going to stay. So I had that mm -hmm. installed. Mm -hmm. um, but I find that people staying there are the best ones to give you good um, constructive advice. And I've mm -hmm. often, you know, one person said you should have more towels. The very first person that stayed there said we had 10 people here and you ran out of hot water. So I had a new hot water tank installed. It was expensive, but really worth doing. So yeah, yeah the people staying there are the ones that can give you the best advice on what you need to do. And I would say nine times out of 10, whenever someone suggests something, I do do it. I implement it. We've had a couple too, right, Robbie? Yeah, we've had stuff. Um, uh, the caulking around the, the faucet in the bathroom, the the bathroom um toilet paper holder yeah um, you should have a separate outside at the outside shower a separate um part to the shower head that comes down and you can wash your dog off hmm. we did that we did that that was a good one because yeah. um we are pet friendly and uh we have a lot of dogs that stay there and we added a little um like pooper scooper thing um shovel shovel little like yeah. a little shovel thing That's so right. it's easier yeah. for them to keep up with the yard and also we added that um thing for the dogs and then the gates work really well so it's um it gives them a nice enclosed area mm -hmm. so uh yeah yeah i would say for all you customers out there who are going to be renting from sarah and from rob and me <laughs> just know that we're, we're going to take your uh, criticisms we're going to take your suggestions we love them so keep them coming Oh yeah, and Sarah's right. Um, there's the the public comment that goes out with your with your rating, and then it says, "Would you like to leave any private comments?" That's just on the side, and a lot of times people will give me ideas on organization. Mm -hmm. or I, I would put this differently, or I would add this over here, or I would, you know, add a type of frying pan or whatever. And um, it, those are really important. Um, private and it's cool when they keep it private because it's it's certainly their opinion on something and it's not going to hurt your your score or anything um if it's a criticism at all but usually it'll be very helpful because it'll put mm -hmm. put your eyes onto something that maybe you wouldn't have seen mm -hmm. so sarah, what, as much as possible but you're not going to yeah. see everything so sarah what's the one thing that you got stolen from one of your properties that really upset you it must have been something taken the only thing taken was I had um, a speaker. It was um, not the Amazon Echo that I have now. It was a different speaker and it was probably like a mm -hmm. $100 speaker. And, you know, a kid might have 
not even meant it could have been a little kid that put it in a backpack i really have been very lucky i have not had anything else taken that's good that's good we had a weird one so you know i, I told you for the first year we collected all those menus yeah so we had like, we had up to like 50 different menus of restaurants both in oak island and southport which is the mainland town right across the bridge and we had a lot of you know, we'd done a lot of work gathering all that stuff and uh, when we had the long-term renter we came back and they were all gone so oh we, had to, we, had to, we had to start all over again with yeah. another year gathering menus all over Oak Island. Oh, that is annoying. Cause that Not is a huge deal. Work. Just annoying. It's I a lot of leg work. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So last one here is get your processes down, working with your management company, your cleaning service, your accountant, your realtor, your customer service agent at Airbnb, and just making sure all your processes are working effectively. They're smooth. You know, it sounds like, Sarah, you've got it down to a science now. I think Rob and I feel like we do now, too. But mm -hmm. it took us a while to get there working with all these people, especially the accountant yeah. was really, really interesting. Yes. We, went, we went with 1-800-ACCOUNTING, which is a online service. Yeah. And it, it took us a while to really, like, get in the groove with them. But it finally yeah. did work out pretty well. That's good. Yeah, yeah. And the nice thing about being a super host, too, is there's a dedicated super host line with Airbnb. Mm -hmm. I like That's that. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any any of these processes were particularly difficult to kind of smooth out? No, they've all been, you know, pretty straightforward. Just they're all very important. And mm -hmm. finding the right cleaning person, the right accountant, making mm -hmm. sure you're using the super host line. That's all. It's all about efficiency and saving time and saving money. Mm -hmm. I think uh, Rob and Connor really struck it, you know, hit it off right away. So that was mm -hmm. really good for us that we yeah. didn't have much learning there with the management company. We, we have people who come out and do exterminator um, yes. stuff. We, we, have, uh, monthly, comes yeah. out, we have someone who comes out every week to clean the hot tub. We have yeah. somebody who comes out to mow the lawn. We have somebody that comes out to take the trash cans to the street on Sunday night and, re and oh, return wow. them empty on Monday morning. It's $7 a week. Yeah. Um, for yeah the actually, Rob... By the way, Rob wants to retire down there and manage all of our properties. And he that also would be wants great. To do, He'd be he also great wants at to do, it. He wants to do the trash can service too. <laughs> it's, <laughs> yeah, that's business. an easy thing to do. Easy. Seven dollars a house. Seven I'll do five dollars a week. I'll do five dollars a week. I'll I'll undercut them. Yeah. But the reason that's important is if you ever have a renter that comes in and the last one didn't take the trash to the street, you have full overflowing trash cans with flies everywhere and they have no, nowhere to go. terrible yeah they have nowhere to go with their trash it's worth keeping up with that and you just pay a flat fee for the whole year and it ends up being seven dollars a week and you just don't worry about the trash it gets taken care of mm -hmm. um, so th that's the kind of stuff that you got to get in place to make it operationally um smooth right mm -hmm. absolutely so these are all the focuses you should have as an Airbnb host. First one is occupancy, uh, using dynamic pricing. It sounds like, Sarah, because your pricing is a little higher, your occupancy doesn't have to be quite as high as some other people. Right. But, you know, we're, we're kind of like on the lower end, 250 to 300, 350. With that, we need our occupancy to be up a little bit higher because we've got to be able to cover right. expenses. Yes. So, um, so that's one thing I'd say. The second one is, Get your property property to profitability before you buy another property. So that's another thing Rob and I've been talking about. We really wanted our property to be truly self-sustaining before we pulled the hundred thousand out and went and bought the second one. So that's uh, that's something you really should be focusing on. Um, planning for seasonability. So you need to actually budget for it. So when your house is renting at max price during your season or several seasons. Um, that's a good time to store up money, right? For when the time that yeah. you're not renting the house as much and you have a lower lower rate. Uh, and also saving some money back for taxes, right? So uh, planning for seasonability. Any any anecdotes here, Sarah, about planning for the ups and downs of your seasons? I don't think so. I think you hit on it. It's really the same thing that I do. You know, just knowing times of the year are not going to be as busy and kind of budgeting for that and making sure you can still meet all of your expenses and making sure you're saving some for taxes, which is important. Um, but no, I think you hit on it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, focusing on the guest experience, not the small stuff. So you mentioned that one speaker that you lost, but you know, again, you don't want to make a big deal out of something like right. that. 
a broken glass, a smudge on a towel. You know, these are just things that are kind of the cost of doing business. Yeah, big deal. Your house, your house reputation and your five-star reviews is what you really care about. I've actually been pleasantly surprised at how little we've had to restock and and put in there. I was I was so sure that every couple of months we were going to have to reload on plates and everything. We've had very little um, disappear. Maybe one set of sheets and a couple of beach towels. Yeah. I was I was told early on that the number one thing you'll lose there is beach towels because most people's beach towels they all look kind of the same. They're yeah. all like white colors and you know. Um, and there's only a standard set of patterns usually for right, very that's standard. true. Everyone gets them at Walmart or, or Target or whatever. So um, they're going to throw them in their suitcase thinking that they're theirs. And right. so you, you have to refresh beach, beach towels more than anything else. But I've been pleasantly surprised the amount of damage been done and the amount of things to, uh, taken, stolen, very few things. Um, people are pretty, pretty good about it. Uh, I've pretty been respectful really, yeah very pleasantly surprised I so agree. last item here is uh, make sure you have fun uh, this should be the most enjoyable business you've ever done and i think that for rob and me at least i'm speaking for me it has been so far it's just been so much fun dealing with people meeting new people being able to use the house whenever it's not rented um and and really looking at our second house third house and kind of growing the business so how, how are you guys feeling about having fun with this business I just feel so lucky to be, you know, I sometimes I think about it. I'm like, wow, I own three houses. Like I'm so blessed. And there was a lot of hard work, a lot of calculated risk. Trust me. Mm -hmm. There's things I did that most people probably wouldn't necessarily have the stomach to do. Right. Um, just taking the risk, the financial risk, but mm -hmm. the greatest risk offers the greatest reward. And if you're smart and you take calculated risks where you're doing research and really putting thought into it, about where you should buy and you're responsive and you work hard, this can be such a great full-time business or side hustle. No doubt. You know, there's a reason it's so popular and um, I have no regrets. I want to keep building my inventory and I love doing it. I think it's so much fun. And I, like I said, I carve out time every day to work on my Airbnbs. Is it, is it your inventory or is it, or is it your building empire? <laughs> <laughs> I like that. We'll say Sarah, do, you, do you think your kids or do you think your kids are watching you do this and they're kind of making mental notes and that maybe they'll try this one day? They do say they say, Mom, you're a badass. And I'm like, oh, thank you. And they're like, no, really, mom, you know, you own these multiple properties. And yes, you know, you certainly have help from George as a wonderful partner and helping you do a lot mm -hmm. of the work. And mm -hmm. um, but they're like, you know, you you took the risk. Like you picked these properties and you did this and you're making them profitable. And um, I love that my kids are witnessing this. Mm -hmm. And I think at mm -hmm. least one of the three will want to do similar stuff. I don't think any of them wants to be a realtor, much to my chagrin, mm -hmm. but they do want to own short-term rentals. Mm -hmm. Rob, any thoughts on the having fun portion of this business? <laughs> oh, it's a lot of fun. Um, I have uh, frequently been on my hands and knees pulling weeds <laughs> and, uh, and somebody will come up and say, man, you're working so hard out here. And I say, it doesn't really feel like work, you know? Um, and I think that's because I genuinely enjoy it. Um, I like the challenge of um, putting on um, a nice place for somebody to come have their vacation. I know how much my vacations mean to me. So uh, it's a lot of fun to um, to do this. I mean, at the end of the day. You know, one of the Absolutely. days, one of the days he was working all day in the yard and he, he put sand down in the fire pit and did all this stuff. And I told him, I said, Rob, you work so hard today. And he said, um, it's just a labor of love. You know, when it's your property, it's just different. It's just a labor of love. It's so true. And it's like, yeah. this is part of your inventory or empire. Like we're lucky to own these properties and very we're very lucky to be making money on them and also providing people with a great experience. No doubt. Let's take a look at some of the photos from our homes. This is the beach house. We're at 127 20th Street Northwest, Oak Island. If anybody wants to look us up on Airbnb, we'd love to have you as a guest. Uh, you can see. So cute. I love the fire yeah, pit. It's a great place. It's so beautiful. We uh, When we moved in, Rob and I were going to actually paint the pink doors. You can see there's a pink door on the front 
and also where the um, owner's closet is on the outside where the outdoor shower is. We were going to actually try to paint it aqua blue because we called this house Dolphin Cove. <laughs> and we had a couple of female guests tell us, absolutely not. Do no, not I love dare. your pink door. It's so Do not dare paint the pink doors. So we, uh, I agree. Yeah. There's but the famous see, golf cart. There's the golf cart. You can see the outdoor um, fenced in patio, which everyone loves to sit out there and mm -hmm. drink their coffee. Got the hot tub. And then, of course, we have the full um, kitchen with the island and the real um, great uh, mm -hmm. custom made table that we play games at. Anything else you'd mention here, Robbie? Uh, just the uh, secret weapon is probably the outdoor shower. I'm telling you, that's People everybody love loves it. an outdoor shower. It's so great yeah, after you come nice. back from the beach. You know, you, you got to knock off that sand. And um, you know what's amazing about this house is uh, Rob really had the idea, and and you can see the picture there of him and his girlfriend and their three boys. And they um, they wanted to have a place that we could go to every single summer and even more than that, where these boys would grow up there. And it's basically like their beach home so that when they're in their 20s and 30s, they'll always remember fondly Oak Island as kind of like our beach destination. So I thought they that definitely was really will. great idea. Yeah. So there's a picture of Rob as the super host. Let's take a look at your first property here in Wintergreen, Virginia, Sarah. So take us through this. So this is the home in Wintergreen. You can see the beautiful mountains. The Blue Ridge Mountains are, I think, um, biased, but some of the most beautiful mountains in the country. And um, the home is great. You can see it's large. It's got the big uh, Florida sky stone fireplace. Um, so it has two fireplaces inside. The two new decks outside. That was quite a feet having those built and then we've completely updated the inside the kitchen is all new you can see with like the lighter cabinets it had dark brown cabinets and like red sinks it was this house actually had wallpaper on ceilings this was a very 70s home was it um, really yes Do you know I, what my you know my favorite thing is sarah i've always said i want to have a beach house and a mountain cabin and what yes. i want to have, what i want to have is the floors and the roof that you have, you know, that ceiling with all I the, love. All the so I was just going to say the, the best room is the room you're talking about with the, with the wood and the rafters. And wow. we had all the floors That's redone, awesome. but it's funny. I had people come in and say, you must paint all those wood, those Brown wood walls white. And I said, absolutely not. This is a mountain lodge. So I call this the lodge. You know, we called it, yeah. we named it Bucks Crossing. My mom named it that because there's a red yeah. one we love called Bucks Crossing. Um, and it just, it there's a lot of big bucks in this area. And it's just, it's got that lodgy vibe, very warm, very welcoming, lots of comfortable spaces. Mm -hmm. So we're really proud of it. And um, it is a great spot for big families to come together for sure. You should mm -hmm. be. Well, we're excited to visit. We yes, we're going to do our swap. Let's do it. And then right, the next about, one you're going to show. One. Now, this is, you can tell, and I'm going to admit this, these are not professional photos, and you can tell, compared to the other photos from the other listing. These, This I just put up there because I needed to get it up for all the events coming, but I am going to have my photographer come in and take better mm -hmm. photos. They're not bad. Hey, you, you know what, Sarah? Sarah, you already have $5,000 worth of booking. So, I mean, <laughs> <you> know. <laughs> I know. So I really shouldn't complain. But this was a completely unfinished cement floor, no walls, basement. Um, you, I am lucky enough to be in a long-term relationship with someone who is a mason. So in the lower um, photo with the deer head hanging on the, we always have a lodgy vibe, but he did that really beautiful stone fireplace. He hand placed each stone, went to New York mm. state to get um, Adirondack cool. stone. And the, cool. you know, the floor, I always do like a luxury vinyl plank in a basement because it does well with moisture. Um, people can be coming in. They could go to the lake for the day and come in with wet feet, but uh, you can see the pool table. We have the bar set up. It's a, just a very, my whole vibe is comfortable and I love interior design. I do a lot of like design on a dime. I mm -hmm. look for deals on marketplace and other areas to make things 
look really nice, but be able to afford to to do all these spaces. So when um, we come see you this come see you this fall, is this where we're staying? This is where you guys can stay. Because uh -huh. you'll there's the king bed there that you can see, and that kind of has like a hotel room vibe. But then in the picture at the top with the bar, the the couch across from that is a pull-out queen sofa. And I'm a big believer if you have an Airbnb, put pull-out sofas in because then you've got two more people it can sleep. No question. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. All right. Well, Sarah, thank you so much for joining us this week for this really cool episode. Thank about you so Airbnb. much for having me. I want to, I want to be on all your podcasts, you know, you, <laughs> but I don't know as much back. about sports. <laughs> we definitely want you back. You and, should uh, come on really the cross one we do next time. Yes, I will definitely come on and I'll make sure my, my sunny boy comes with me next time. No doubt about it. And uh, this is a great topic, Airbnb. What a great little business. And uh, all of us have had success with it. And all of you guys can too. So just uh, what I would say is don't hesitate and think about it for years like Rob and I did. Just do it. Just find just a way do to it. do it. Take that calculated risk and do it. Get in there. You know, you can't really lose with real estate. I mean, real estate's kind of, you know, they're not making any more land. So nope, it's the way to wealth. And learn to do it. You may lose a tiny bit your first year, possibly. Sarah didn't, but um, if uh, if you do things the right way, you'll you'll have a real nice little business, and you can go on to property two and three. And if any of you need help buying an Airbnb in Massachusetts, New Hampshire, or Maine, I'm licensed in all three states. How can they find your Airbnbs? I guess so. I would have to send them like listing links, which is probably what you would have to do too. I mean, how do you have like a way to direct people? I mean, what I usually do is just send them the link. But um, if they want to reach out to me directly, you know, we can provide, I guess, our email addresses or cell phones. I don't know and what actually, you guys typically do. Actually, what I'll do in this um, podcast episode is I'll put in the comments down below all three of our listings. Yeah. So you guys can get to it right That's away. That's a great idea. And I'm totally. totally fine if you want to share my contact info because as a realtor, it's out there publicly anyway. And if you guys want to see Sarah on our podcast again, drop us a comment. We'd love to hear it. Thanks, everybody. Have a great night. Definitely like like the video and please subscribe to the channel. We'll see you next time. Okay, bye-bye.